This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Bandits and Bad Magic by Leslie Heron. Chapter 24, Moringa. They say the eyes are the windows to the soul, but in truth, it was really the micro-expressions around the eyes that gave one a glimpse into the mind beneath. A smile in the crinkle of the crow's feet, or the worried tension held in the brow. A million little cues that painted a story. Lucian's stance exuded an intentional air of relaxed disinterest, but his eyes betrayed a tale of a master chess player advancing in on the kill. He just had to decide which pawn to move next, and by the time their uninvited guests finished falling over themselves, he was already twelve steps ahead, each one an open book. With a slight wave of his hand, generals, dignitaries, and spiritual leaders hastened to clear him a path. Lucian nodded to one or two of the more powerful ones as he glided past. Your return is welcome news indeed. Eric's back straightened, tensing painfully as the most powerful man in the country stopped before him, staring directly into his eyes. It was like gazing into the very soul of a hungry shark. I'm so glad you're safe. Little brother. Lucian let the words hang in the air like a subtle threat before he reached out a hand, gently resting it upon the fur lined hood of Varen's filthy cloak. Turning, he gave a small tug, dragging the prince away from the trespassers. I've been beside myself with worry. Come, come, step away from the imposter and let me have a look at you. Varen's mouth hung agape, as his eldest sibling, who had never shown even the slightest bit of warmth towards him, gave him a once-over before pulling him into a hug. The embrace was short and stiff, a clinical act to establish a narrative. Lucian turned, putting his back to the group and stepping away from the prince. These charlatans didn't hurt you, did they? He forced back the chuckle in his throat when the other man failed to answer. Well, no matter. Guards! He snapped his fingers in the direction of the ragtag group, signaling they be carted off to the dungeons. Pyra could see Eric was ready to say something, his jaw slackening in response to several guards unsheathing their weapons in their direction. She lurched forward, pushing herself between him and the regent lord. Wait! Her sharp voice echoed off the tall ceiling of the war room, and all eyes shifted in her direction. Her body practically vibrated with fear as adrenaline pulsed through her, but she couldn't let this man open his mouth in their defense. Even knowing that, every time in the past when she spoke before this council, it ended with another small part of her soul being crushed. But today, they would listen. Taking a brave step forward, she raised her hands to address the gathered men. Despite what Lucian claims as truth, I can assure you all that this, she paused, gesturing behind her, is Elias Folkgrave. My husband and your king, the rightful ruler of... Lucian spun, backhanding her across the face with a fistful of rings, sending her sprawling across the floor. Silence! If the council wanted the opinion of a mottled whore, we'd hardly ask a gutter queen like you. Varen dove to his knees, placing a hand on Pyra's shoulder as she tried to push herself up. Her cheek was smeared with blood from where the jewelry had cut into her. Tears began to well up in her amber-colored eyes as she moved a hand to her face. He wanted to ask if she was all right, but the defiance on her features told him it was an unnecessary gesture. 
Amid the collective gasps and chuckles from the council, Undine took an involuntary step forward, her armored fingers gripping painfully tight around her weapon. Her voice came out barely more than a guttural growl as she snapped, How dare you! Lucian hissed between grit teeth, his eyes moving up to meet the filthy tribal. How dare I? He shook his head as he looked her up and down with disgust. Because of your misguided venture, the royal guard has been decimated. You had but one task, to keep the queen out of my way. He turned his back on her dismissively. Unsurprisingly, you couldn't even accomplish that. I have half a mind to ship you back to that wigwam you call a home. He motioned for the guards, who were lingering in confusion, to carry out their orders. Varen jumped to his feet and shook his head violently at the heavily armored soldiers, encouraging them, wordlessly, to stand down. Have you something to say, little brother? Lucian turned to glare at him. Oh, that's right. He clicked his tongue against his teeth as he shook his head. I'd encourage your silence as well, but... Enough! Eric moved in front of the prince and surprised the regent lord by reaching out and shoving him. Your issue is with me, not them. Lucian took a step back, brushing off his robes as if something filthy had just touched him. King indeed. He turned, facing the members of his council. He doesn't even sound like Elias. Don't be fooled by his lies. My brother is dead. No, I don't sound the same. Eric ignored the tremor of fear that rippled down his spine and moved to address the others in the room, doing his best to act in a way his own brother might. And I'm not dead. I have been trapped on a different world for the past five decades. I adapted the local accent to better fit in. He turned back to face Lucian, who, for the first time, was betraying a sense of fear. He had hit home with a foolproof lie. Elias had been trapped on another world. Now he had an idea as to who had done so. He narrowed his eyes. And now I'm back to claim what is mine. Lucian licked his lips. If this truly was Elias, no. He pushed that thought away before it could truly invade him. That was reactionary thinking. The fact that he had not been killed outright proved that this man was a liar. But they were eerily similar. Eric took a step forward, gesturing to himself as he did. I assure you, I am the man you call brother. Lucian couldn't help the amused exhale of breath from his nose. In his youth, he had made sure Elias and the snot prince knew he did not see them as siblings. He had ensured they had known he saw them as nothing more than bastard half-breeds, a result of their father's misguided alliance. Of course this wasn't Elias. That man was not big on speeches or catering to the council, and certainly would not have allowed anyone to strike his precious queen. Unwilling to reveal his winning hand, he stepped away from the imposter and faced the others in the room. Very well then, brother. What proof do you have that you are who you say? And not a simple con man. Eric frowned. Not only does your queen vouch for me, but I control the undead. He gestured to the others behind him. Bob pushed his way through his traveling companions, stopping at fingertips length. There was a murmur among the gathered men. But Lucian let out a long, fake chuckle. I've seen enough. If one lonely, well-trained shade-born and a passing resemblance are your only proof, there is no reason to keep you alive. 
he snapped his fingers at the guards once more. Eric floundered. Bob's menacing growls and glowing purple eyes weren't enough to sway the regent lord, but the council members looked ready to fling themselves from the window. All he had to do was convince them. He took in a deep breath, returning his attention to Lucian. I can prove it. Then do so, before I kill you myself. Don't waste words trying to convince him. Let me have some fun, and I'll show everyone. Eric shook his head, chastising the little bug, before he began to roll up his sleeves. He licked his lips and began to focus his mind, lifting two fingers into the air before him. Uh, my lord, if I may, before we are forced to endure any displays of dark magic... Eric's concentration was shattered by the weaselly voice of a skeletal man. He watched as an elderly priest stepped forward. Clearly a member of the Brotherhood, his vestments were far more lavish than the others he had seen, perhaps one of a higher station. Floor-length robes, dyed deep black and trimmed with red, did little to hide his feeble stature. He wore a crimson sash around his waist that was adorned with gilded ancient lettering and a modest red cap on his head that couldn't contain his wispy strands of white hair. He leaned against a tall, golden crozier bearing a large ornamental hook that held the image of a feather and an open book. Glittering rubies and silver accents glinted up the length of what amounted to the world's most garish walking stick. Lucian took a step back, pulling his attention away from the false king. Of course, Archbishop. The old man hobbled forward a step, his staff clinking against the hard floor. As you know, I have received numerous reports of this man's abilities. The survivors of the attack on our re-education project say he was a demon, the true king, able to call upon the forces of hell itself. He closed his eyes, steadying himself as he took another step. We lost Brother Alistair in that confrontation, along with several monks doing the Lord's work. While detestable, it cannot be denied that it was a display of intense dark magics. Something His Highness was known for in his final days. Guilt washed over Eric leaving him nauseated over the events that transpired that night. But, in truth, the Holy Crusaders had planned far worse for those fey creatures before he had arrived. Regardless of his feelings, however, the account helped strengthen his case. The Archbishop came to a stop at Lucian's side, his eyes moving to someone behind Eric. But others were less impressed. Father Morgan believed the man before us to be an imposter, a mouthpiece for an arcanist with a known penchant for weaving tall tales. His gaze intensified, and Atlas's expression did little to hide his guilt. He even used his magics on the good father's own daughter, forcing her to join him in sin. Atlas began to burn red. Uh, I'll have you know, it was my boyish charms that won her over, not my magics. And we never even got around to the sinful bits, much to my chagrin. The archbishop gave him a withering look. My point being, if this man is not Elias, but rather a clever puppet, why not eliminate the man pulling the strings? Remove the arcanist, the undead abomination, 
and any other source of aid that this individual might use to trick us. Then demand your proof. Ah, oh, very clever, Your Excellency. Lucian waved for the guards. Do as he suggests. Show the mage, his horrid bear, and that stinking undead to our finest cell in the dungeons, please. Ha! Ah, that's a fine welcome to the kingdom for you. I haven't done a lick of magic, and suddenly I'm being blamed for it all. Atlas shouldered off the guard's hands. I know how to walk. Gah, come on, Barry. Let's see what the grandest city in Ebra considers hospitality. He motioned for the bear to follow him. Bob managed to break one guard's arm before he could be persuaded, an extra effort on Eric's part, to release the man. He relented with a long, annoyed groan and followed the mage from the room. When the heavy wooden doors shut on their footsteps, Eric looked around at what remained of their divided forces. Pyra was leaning against Ondine, more shaken than injured, while Varen stood protectively in front of her. Evan, it would seem, had disappeared. He hoped that meant the tiny Merc was set up somewhere, ready to jump into action if things went sideways. We don't need the angry small child. We can do this. Lucian gestured at the ground in front of the charlatan. Well, I'm a busy man. Let's get this farce over so I can get back to matters of actual import. Time to put his money where his mouth was. Eric closed his eyes, mentally preparing. He could feel the shadows in the room with his mind, like a tiny buzzing in his spatial awareness. He began running calculations for each. Too much energy, and they would simply stop in place, held down by the amount of force being exerted. Not enough, and they would ignore his efforts. Distance, intensity, shape, size, every aspect mattered. Within seconds, he had two dozen points singled out in the room. More than enough for a puppet show. He lifted his right hand, two fingers extended. He began to tug at the edges of the darkness. His eyes opened and he pulled against the shadows. They lengthened and broadened, spreading across the room towards him. They stretched down across the stained glass window, enveloping it like a curtain, causing the glow of the torches to become searing beacons of light in the growing, oppressive darkness. He could hear shouts of alarm, but he ignored them, holding his concentration, equations racing in his mind. Down the walls and across the floor, the shadows moved, like snakes pouring out of the corners of the room. Almost there, Eric broke into a cold sweat, the strain on his mind and body becoming evident the more he pushed the spell. The shadows began to waver before they reached his feet. I can help. Wraith used Eric's own shadow to reach out, grabbing hold of the tendrils moving across the ground, hauling against them, dragging them inch by inch up Eric's body. They pulsed and writhed across him, swirling along his chest, wrapping his arm, then finally reaching his fingertips. Visibly shaking, he used the inky darkness to scrawl a black rune in the air. The swirling shadows in the room snapped to a stop, frozen in place by the sheer force exerted by the spell, then shattered into a million pieces. The room became a blizzard of shadows, each piece flying wildly on its own trajectory. Eric watched as grown men who had led troops into battle cowered beneath their raised arms like frightened children. He was proud of this, his only sigil. He had realized early on he could zip a single point of shadow around the room, but for each additional point, it required another mental equation. That's when he realized 
he could bind a rune that fractured a connected shadow, then automatically targeted each individual shard and applied a slight variation of the same motion calculation to each. The more shadow he connected to the spell at the start, the more spectacular the effect. But when his gaze landed on the Regent Lord, he was surprised to find him staring back, unimpressed and unafraid. The look on his face was calculating. A tiny giggle in Eric's mind encouraged him to push on. He surrendered his body over to the shadow bug and watched as the blizzard began pulsing with his heartbeat. It began to thicken and coalesce and began forming into physical particles. He staggered, nearly collapsing to his knees. A million fragments, all pulling on his personal energy, his shade to gain mass. The tiny projectiles began tearing through tapestries and destroying furniture, but dodging around the individual bodies of the council members in a display of insane precision. Wraith pushed farther, and black mist roiled up around him, his arms raising on their own. Let's make this a good show. Eric struggled to find his footing as the shadow bug, overcome with sinful glee, moved him to the center of the room. Wraith, no! He could feel something draining at him, eating away at his very core. Wraith, yes! The shadows followed his every step, leaving smoky rings on the stones in his wake. They writhed and plumed off his fingers, until, with the shadow bug still pulling the strings, Eric threw his hands out. The shadows erupted outward, expanding, filling the room with near-pitch blackness. The fire from the torches and the glow from the window were snuffed out. The only points of light were himself and the archbishop, who was muttering a prayer as he clung to his crozier. Wraith held him there for a moment, looking eagerly around at the room before he slammed his hands back together, collapsing the cosmic darkness inward into his borrowed body. Eric managed to glance down at himself without betraying movement, to see his entire form had become a seamless void. Wraith's abilities far eclipsed his own, but they were sharing a power source, him. It took everything he had not to collapse under the weight of the spell, and he felt nearly as hollow as he looked. The void lingered on his form for several tense moments before it broke and he slumped forward. He managed to catch himself before falling completely and staggered back towards his companions. Undine put her hand around him, helping him remain upright. Afraid of what he might find, Eric tentatively reached inside himself feeling the edges of his shade. Only a small, tattered and frayed remnant was left. Had Wraith gone on any longer, he might have died. I... I'm sorry. I got excited. Eric made to respond, but nothing wanted to work. His lips were numb, and his voice was empty. I stop eating for now. Help you get better. A slow clapping cut through the air, drowning out the worried mutterings and cries of panic. Lucian smiled. Check and mate. Indeed, I cannot argue with that. He took a step forward and flung an arm around the other man, pulling him into a tight embrace. You have been missed, brother. Lucian released him and turned back to the murmuring crowd behind him. Spread the word. Tonight there shall be a feast in honor of the king's return. He shall retake his crown and the command of Ebra before dawn. He swiveled on his heel, turning back to face his brother. You're right. You look exhausted. He clapped the man on the cheek several times. But of course... You must be tired from your travels. 
you look exceptionally peaky. Please, retire to your chambers for a rest. We will send for you when we are ready for your speech. Having managed enough energy to wipe the sweat from his brow, the words hit Eric in his gut, and he dropped his hand. Sp speech Lucian smiled. Of course, you must say something to the gathered masses. You are the king, after all. Nodding with uncertainty, Eric allowed himself to be ushered out of the room, half carried by his friends. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get on that right now. Standing at the center of the ruin that was his war chamber, the Regent Lord grinned brightly at his council. In light of the king's return, we shall adjourn this meeting and take up these matters at a later time. Good day, gentlemen. Lucian bowed heavily, gesturing to the door with a dramatic sweep of his hands. He could tell the others were disgruntled by the turn of events, but he couldn't be happier. This would prove most fortuitous if handled correctly. As the archbishop teetered past him, he tugged gently against the man's arm, pulling him aside as the last of the crowd passed through the door. Your Excellency, might I have a moment of your time? I have a proposition for you. Of Bandits and Bad Magic is book three of the ongoing series by Leslie Heron. Tune in every few weeks to hear the latest chapter as it's being written. If you'd like to listen to books one and two, you can find links in the description. Do you have any idea who I am? Don't know, don't care. Now, get in the cell, would you? This is preposterous. A travesty of justice. As if even my talents could make that moron look good. Listen, I heard it all before. Now, get in, or I'll have Brutus over there force you in. Ain't that right, Brutus? Brutus? Fine. Come on, Barry. But I want it on record that I could turn you both into piles of ash with a snap of my fingers. I simply choose not to. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Come on, Brutus. Let's see if there's anything left in the mess hall, yeah? I think Meg was making some of them sweet rolls you like. Brutus? God, no respect at all. I tell you, back in the day, there wasn't a guard in Ebra that didn't know the name Atlas. I could walk into any jail cell and... Uh, hey now, no hogging the best bits of straw. <laughs> God, fine. I'll sleep in the corner then. Stingy git. <laughs>